Hello, I'm Michael here for Tactic Imperialis. Welcome to episode 6 of An Elfin Adventure, my Age of Sigma hobby project. Today we're going to be talking about the new additions to the army, of which there is one, talking about an ongoing project that I'm going to start alongside the Dark Elves with my High Elves, and we're going to be talking about the third game, although it's technically week 4, of the campaign that I've been taking part in at the local games workshop. I wasn't facing a summoning army. Maybe we had some hope of getting a relic this time. Uh, there was a few twists to the game, but I'll explain that later in the video when we talk about the game and analysis section. Um, but for now, let's get on to the models. Um, if you have missed any of the previous episodes, make sure to check out the link in the description for the Elfin Adventure playlist. That will allow you to see everything we've done in the series so far. And if you look at the last episode, you can have a look at the entire army, with the exception of the unit that we've added in this episode. So with that all out of the way, let's get into the video. This is episode 6 for an Elfin Adventure. Okay, so starting the models off is our new addition to the army. This is a unit of five dark riders with one simple conversion. I'll let you work it out. So the dark riders, um, I was talking about in episode five as a possible addition to the army because they're fast, they have good shooting, and they have some penalties for battle shock. Um, basically, if a unit rolls a one for its battle shock test uh, within 14 inches of a dark rider, um, I add d6 to it, which is really helpful for things that like maybe need a two. Um, to stay on the board, you roll the one, and they roll the one, they think they're safe. Nope, I roll a d6, you've lost some dudes. Sorry. Um, so it is pretty useful. Um, I don't know how good it is in the campaign we'll be doing because everybody's running pretty much lizard men in chaos with a few exceptions. So most things have pretty good bravery, but um, it does have its uses. Uh, their repeats of crossbows are three shots each as opposed to the two that normally apply to uh, regular um, dark shards which is good, and they're pretty resilient with a 5 plus save, and the dark shields allow them to reroll 1s against shooting, and reroll 1s and 2s in close combat. So they're pretty good at staying alive. Uh, the models themselves, they're really pretty. Um, I'll just show you the unit champion, which is the Herald. Uh, you can see just how it's put together. Um, the legs are actually part of the sculpt, so they're actually mounted onto the horse. So when you put this together, you've got a central sort of body column, and then the legs are part of the sides for the horse, which is pretty cool. Um, the head is attached to one side, you attach one of the reins, uh, and then you build up with a cloak and torso, the arms, the head, the shield, and the weapons, and all that. Uh, the Herald is the only person, there's only one crossbow in the whole kit, which is why he's carrying it, because he's a unit champion. But everyone has a crossbow that they carry on their side, as well as a sword for melee engagements, because most of them are carrying their shield as well as a spear, in the case of this guy over here, and my as yet unfinished one. In terms of paint scheme, I've stayed pretty true to the Dark Elves that I've been doing so far. I've done a black steed, because they're known as dark steeds, and I used the red rune technique I talked about in episode 1, where I painted into the rune and then wiped it off to pick out the red rune. I then painted around it with a very fine detail brush um, in black, and then the wash helped as well. Uh, I've got a two-tone brown for the mane and the tail. Uh, the underside of the cloak is a new colour. It is Cantor Blue, which is the new version of Regal Blue. Um, I wanted a really dark blue um, for a project that I'll show you uh, a little bit later in the video. So I thought it would work on dark riders to have a darker blue than the um, the crag blue that I use most often, and certainly for, compared to the ice blue. Um, there are a few bits of brightness, so for example the cloaks which are white, or in the case of the other dudes, brown with sort of white edging. You've got the white on the bird on the shield, you've got some stark silver trim. The red armour I've washed so it's slightly darker. But it's pretty good. Uh, the banner is a sculpted banner in this instance. So you can see that's pretty much what it looks like. I have also painted around um, some of the edges in black just to define them a little bit. It's only sculpted on one side, so on the other side I have simply done a Hageneth transfer. Now, if you haven't worked it out already, the heads are not Dark Riders. They're Executioners. This kit this Executioner's kit, I'm singing its praises from the rooftops, it's a fantastic kit. I have got so much out of the Executioner's kit, you'll see it on another model later in the video. Uh, it's been used for my Core 1 Knights, I've used it um, all over the place. It's so helpful and I'm really glad I've got that kit. Um, to anyone who's a Dark Elf player starting out and wants some conversion components, you can't go wrong with that kit. I mean, the Black Guard heads would probably be useful for unit champions in Dreadspear or Bleak Sword units, although I'd have to get some to check that fully. Um, the execution heads work really well on the Dark Riders, because the Dark Riders are terror troops. That's their whole sort of theme, their whole mythos. And wearing death masks in the shape of skulls, well, that sort of reinforces the theme. 
I just realized I got some purple on that crossbow. I need to repaint that. Oops, I goofed. Um, the Herald is also carrying a blade, which is from the same kit. Uh, it's one of the Blackguard knives that you can give to your standard bearer. The normal guys have silver masks, and the Herald has a golden one. Now, this guy on the far left is a demonstration of how I've gone about making the model. So, at the moment, he's fully glued together with the exception of the fact that this torso component comes off. The arms, the head, is everything is glued to the torso, which then comes off, leaving the... I'll just actually pull it off so you can see. Leaving two components for me to paint. This component paints pretty easily on its own, and this component paints pretty easily on its own. You can't actually get it any more separated than this if you want to do it quickly. Um, so the way I paint them is I do it like this. So this component, this component, get them all prepped, all base coated, and then I glued this on. It mounts pretty easily. Uh, I think I've, yeah, it's close enough for demonstration purposes. Uh, and then I do the washes. I do all the highlighting here at this stage. And when it's done, I attach the shield, the sword, and the crossbow and paint those individually. Um, just because I don't like gluing them on first, they get in the way. You can tell just looking at the crossbows how big they are, they get in the way. The swords, the shields particularly, I've always had an issue with shields on cavalry. I'm just going to put the squad back over here because they're coming out of shot as I keep punching things. Um, so it's a really good way to get them built quickly. You could do them as Doomfire Warlocks um, if you don't like the cloaks, for example. The Doomfire Warlocks is a pretty good option. Um, one of the guys at the shop was saying about using Sister of Slaughter masks instead of the Doomfire Warlock um, sort of faces, which... Might actually work. I mean, I'd have to try it, but it sounds like an interesting idea if you wanted to do dual fire warlocks but didn't like their heads, for example. Um, I have used these guys in game. We'll talk about that a little later in the video. But for now, let's get on to the other models, which are not new, but they are part of an ongoing project. Next up, I have repainted my bolt thrower. It was in drastic need of getting done, so I redid it. Uh, I've done it in a dark wood, and I've also replaced the single bolt with the repeating bolts. Um, just because that way I can use it as a reaper or a repeater. I've also taken off the little base and mounted the two crewmen on separate individual bases. Uh, the main reason I've done this is because war machines on bases, like ball throwers are designed to not really have one, and it was kind of impossible to mark the crew as a separate unit, which they technically are. So I needed them on their own individual bases so that they could be removed as opposed to uh, just mounted on a base with the bolt thrower, just for ease of gameplay. And it also means that it's a little bit easier to stand the thing up and put it in places that it's supposed to go as opposed to trying to balance two bases. So I'm pretty happy with that. In terms of what I've done with the painting, I said darker wood fits with dark elves. It's got the gold trim, bits of silver as well. Uh, there's an ice blue gem, there's blue gems knocking around. There's a lot of blue actually, uh, just the spot color and then the darker blue bolts um, just to tie them in. Uh, now, the main thing is the crew. Uh, this crewman you probably wouldn't even recognize because he's got two new arms and a new head. The head comes from the Call One Knights kit, and the two arms are Blackguard and Executioner parts. What a surprise. Uh, the sword is Blackguard, the head is Executioner's. He's also got a High Elven sword on his back. I, I didn't take that off. Um, I painted him in my Dark Elf colors, except uh, he's got red robes as well. So he's got silver armor with a little bit of purple underneath, and then the overcoat is red. The other crewman is painted as a High Elf. So he's got white robes with red trim, it's kind of like my high elves do, and then he's got a new dark blue armour. This is the Cantor blue that I was referring to a little earlier. This is what I'm going to be doing with my high elves, is white robes with blue blue armour and red trim. Uh, you might be able to see just the back of shot, but I'll get them into picture in a moment, just how the scheme will work. Um, I've also done a sort of freehand rune on his um, back, I don't really know why. It doesn't have any meaning that I'm aware of. Uh, but it just allows you to see the whole model in a bit of better detail. And that's sort of what I've done there. Now, the reason I've done that is so I can feel it is a dark or a high elf bolt thrower and not really have any quarrels about it because there's a dark elf crewman and there's a high elf crewman. It's the same people. Um, they are the same team now, so I, I can get away with doing it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull my high elves into shot. So, bolt thrower, back away please. This is a archer and a spearman. Uh, the spearman actually has a dark rider spear because his broke. And they show off what I'm going to be doing with the high elves as regards paint scheme. I'm just going to see if I can get the camera to refocus. There we go. So the archer, I've done the overcoat in blue just because he's not going to have any blue armor. I didn't want it to be all the white. So I went with the dark blue there, uh, the white under robes and the red trim as before with a lighter brown compared to the dark brown that you see on my dark elves instead of being... Um, 
Doom Ball Brown, it's Steel Legion Drap, just for a different um, tone. Uh, he's also got a silver helmet, because I tried the blue on the Spearman's helmet, and it just didn't work, I didn't like it. So I changed it to silver, and I've done the same on the headdress for the Archer. Uh, the colour scheme that I've chosen is, is sort of tied into the Dark Elves. So White Robes is High Elven, that's just the way it works. The red trim is to mimic the red armour that the High Elves have, that the Dark Elves have, sorry. The blue is to represent the spot colour, which is the blue that I use on the Dark Elves. Um, the blue on the Dark Elves is brighter, but I've done it in the really dark blue here as a contrast. And it looks really good, I really do quite like it. Uh, particularly on the Archer, I really like it on the Archer. The Spearman, I'm still tossing up what to do with that red middle plate, and whether to do that silver, or whether to do it blue. Um, I'll just turn him around so you can just have a full look at him. Uh, this just gives you a whole idea of what I'm planning to do with the High Elves, a sort of long-term idea. So, the eventual plan is to repaint all the High Elf Spearmen and Archers, bare minimum, to this, which gives me 40 repainted High Elves. Um, what I'll do beyond that, I'm not sure, because the Phoenix Guard, White Lions, Dragon Princes, Silver Helms, I mean, the Silver Helms could probably get away with it, but a lot of them are very unique troops. Rather than being drawn from a specific city, um, like the citizenry troops, like um, <coughs> Spearmen, Archers, and Silver Helms, they are drawn from a specific place, Crace, Calidor, um, <coughs> at least in the old fluff, excuse my cough, um, don't know why that started up all of a sudden. So I'm not sure whether I should put them into this colour scheme, I probably should, realistically, but they're going to be a nightmare to paint. The Dragon Princes, the Cavalry with full shields, they're a nightmare. Phoenix Guard have got the Halberds, the White Lions have their axes. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, folks. So, repainting them is going to be a bit of a pain. The Sea Guard, you can't get behind the shields. So I'm not sure, but the minimum I'll do is get all the Citizen repaint repainted. That's the Archers, Spearmen, and Silver Helms. That will be the ongoing part of the project, because I'm going to leave the Dark Elves for now. I'm not going to buy anything new. Uh, obviously, I'm going to finish this guy first, but... I'm going to get them all repainted and sort of, that's the next part of the hobby part. Uh, future purchases, i uh, still got a War Hydra on my radar, um, although not for a while. Um, I didn't exactly get the give up hobby for Lent because I bought the Dark Riders like three days ago. But um, yeah, I think I'm going to abstain from purchasing, at least for a while. Maybe get a Hydra towards the end of semester because I think these Hiles I really want to take my time on so they might take me a while. Anyway, that is all the models for today's episode. Uh, let me know what you think of the High Elf paint scheme, because obviously that's new. Uh, let me know what you think of it, whether it works, what you'd change, all that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to do a little bit of reshuffling, and then we'll talk about the third game in the campaign that we've been doing, the Games Workshop. All right, let's talk about game number three. Uh, if you wonder why I've changed, it's because it's a couple of days later. Um, I tried to record this at the time, and I wasn't happy with it, so I'm recording it again. So the game we played was supposed to be 130 wounds on my side and then either 130 on my opponent's or 100 if he was summoning, um, but that didn't quite pan out because my opponent only had 85 wounds worth of stuff. Helpful. So what I did was I took my army down to 100 wounds and because my opponent was playing a sort of hybrid dark elf list, it was dark elves and ogres, I know that combo is ridiculous, um, I lent him 15 wounds of my stuff. So the army I ran was my Cauldron, Call One Knight, Call One Sorceress, Bolt Thrower, Shadow Blade, Dark Riders, Dark Shards, Corsairs, Ten Witch Elves, uh, Death Hag, Sorceress, Ten Executioners, and the Call One Knights were also at um, five guys as well. I did have the full ten with me originally. The models I had to cut was one Assassin, my Battlestander Bearer, uh, ten Call One Knights, and oh, five Call One Knights, sorry, ten Wounds five executioners and five witch elves i had left out five witch elves five dark shards my medusa foot dreadlord one assassin and lock here fell heart uh if you want to just go and corroborate that check the last episode um so his army was unique let's say that he had a really cool converted dreadlord um from isabella von karstein it looked absolutely awesome he had a foot mounted sorceress he had a reaper bolt thrower he had 10 bleak swords which was an interesting look for me at how they work because I'm kind of thinking Bleak Swords versus Dread Spears. He had five Core One Knights that he borrowed off of me. He had a Master with Battle Standard that he borrowed off of me. He had um, a Ogre Battle Standard Bearer, six Iron Guts, uh, another five Core One Knights of his own, a Dragon Sorceress, and a Dragon Dreadlord. Yes, the guy had two dragons. And he was... Yeah, he had two dragons in a 100-wound game, and 
I had no monsters whatsoever. It was um, it was gonna be tough. It was gonna be tough. I'll, I'll say that much. So we set up, and they changed the mission as well. There's not many relics left in the campaign. Oh, there wasn't many pre game I think there was four at the start of the evening. And uh, what they did was because there were four games, instead of like, okay, everyone just plays for a relic and we'll just do it the old-fashioned way, they changed it up. So they put three objectives out on the table. Uh, well, they put three relics on every table. And what they said was, one of them is real. The other two are not. Either Zinch is messing with your head or... You've taken a bath in too much witch brew, as probably would be my case. So the mission changed, and we had to get all three of these relics to guarantee we got the real one. There was a chance that you grabbed two, your opponent grabbed one, and you still lost the game, which is kind of annoying, but there's not much you can really do about it. So I wasn't really sure how to go about doing it. My sort of plan was to use the highly maneuverable elements of my army, that particularly being the Dark Riders, to grab an objective quickly and then just run run back, get it secure, and go again. I wasn't planning to use them very aggressively. They were to be sort of snatch and go. Same with my Cold One Sorceress. And if one came too close, my Witch Elves could probably go back in the other direction on my Death Hag, pass it on, or just run for cover and get it safe. It was a rough plan, but there was a big issue with doing it. And that's two dragons, because dragons can fly. Obviously, dragons can fly. And that makes them an absolute nightmare to deal with. So we had the same number of units as it turned out. So he won the roll off and he went first. He didn't do that much on turn one. He just came forward with everything. He ran a lot of his stuff. Um, he got his cold ones in bo on both sides near the objectives. He got his iron guts up to the middle objective and he shot three of my executioners with his vault thrower. Blood shield didn't save me, unfortunately. Um, so I was like, okay, this isn't too bad. His dragons have been quite cautious, like they're in cover. So they're a bit far back, but they can still do some damage to me if I'm not careful. So on my turn, I decided I've got to throw caution to the wind because there's no way I can really hope to play this one passively, try and just blast him off and then snatch and go because he can just grab them with his cavalry next turn, run them back and win the game almost guaranteed. So I sort of went in and I went in hard. The plan was the Dark Riders were going to snipe out a couple of Cold One Knights, or at least snipe one of them off, if, if it's all possible. Um, my other Cold, my Cold One Knights, who I was going to buff with the Cauldron's ability, which I did, so they're now wounded on twos, were going to charge the other unit of Cold One Knights, hopefully kill a few and then route the rest in future. And my Executioners were going to go and try and do as much damage to the Iron Guts as possible. I was just hoping for a mad bunch of sixes. It didn't quite pan out. I mean, the shooting scored a wound. And I think I managed to shoot about half an Iron Gut or a full Iron Gut to death with my Bolt Throw, which I was quite happy with. Um, my Cold One Knights made a good, strong charge, took out two Cold Ones, maybe even three, um, at the end of it, because he didn't roll very well for his saves. So I was in a pretty decent position on that side. The problem was the Executioners. For the first time, they let me down. They scored, I think, four or six more. I think it was four mortal wounds they scored. So they killed another one, basically but were then completely pulverized. They managed to survive for actually two rounds, I think. They survived the first round for sure. And Shadowblade, I, I brought Shadowblade out because I didn't think I was going to get another chance to use him. Uh, he managed to score a couple of wounds as well, which is kind of all right. But not long after he was killed, his D3 wounds, Heart of War explosion was pretty helpful. Um, and then the executions were finally finished off in the third round which was in my turn too, because he won the roll off for initiative the next turn. In that turn, he didn't do that much. His Cold Ones charged my Dark Riders in what became the most hilarious combat I've ever seen. Uh, they basically took all day to kill them. It took him until turn four to kill these Dark Riders in combat, and they just kept shooting him. By the time he was done, he had one and a half Cold One Knights left. My Witch Elves are put in a good show. I forgot to mention this. I keep doing that. Uh, they came forward with the Death Hag on turn one, charged the Bleak Swords, and took them out. It needed their bit of help from the Death Hag, but um, they did a good job. They got them down to three, and they failed his battle shock and ran away. So it was pretty good on, on, from the Witch Elves. Well done, girls. You did a good job this time. Um, though I do think they really need that Death Hag in order to make them good. Um, his turn two, I don't think, did he? He might have done. He might have charged with his dragon that turn. Yeah, I think he did. His um, 
is Dragon Sorceress charged by Cauldron, and his Dragon Dreadlord charged by Bolt Thrower, immediately killing it. The Cauldron actually survived, and actually did really well. With a bit of help from the Corsairs at range, I was actually able to kill the Dragon Sorceress over three rounds of combat. I think it took until his turn three for me to kill it, because I won initiative on turn three. So I was pretty happy. I mean, it took about half my wounds. I was down to six, I think, by the end of the combat. Although one of them was self-inflicted where I tried to buff my wound rolls and actually whiffed. Um, Hellebron was a bit under underperforming. She took three wounds off in one round, but she was very strong, very difficult to hit with. She didn't roll very well on a three up to hit. And unlike Witch Elves where you reroll ones, she didn't get any way to reroll to hit. So it was not ideal. Um, his Dragon Dreadlord then... Well, actually, no. Let me just rewind. My turn two, what happened? I think on my turn two, I killed off his block of coal ones on the left with my coal ones, and I was still sniping at his other side. Uh, my Witch Elves ran forward and charged his Battle Standard. Uh, they took him down to one wound um, over two rounds, and then he was finished off by the Death Hag. Um, but Isabella the Dreadlord charged in and killed the Death Hag quite easily because he gave himself rerolls to wound. Uh, he chose his foot dreadlord to be the general as opposed to the dragon dreadlord, which surprised me a little bit, but I kind of understand why. Uh, the foot dreadlord was basically camping next to the bolt thrower and could easily buff it until it got close and then could buff himself and then go in and do the damage. But the dragon dreadlord's command ability is really nice. It gives a unit rerolls to hit and basically immune to battle shock if they're within 4d6 inches of him, which is really good. I, I would really like that ability on something like executioners or something that hits on fours. Um, like a bolt thrower would actually benefit more from rerolls to hit than rerolls to wound, I'll be honest. So, I'm still surprised by that just but I sort of see why. Um, in my turn three, my core ones came around and like, I've got to kill these iron guts now. My core one sorceress grabbed the relic on the left flank, which was great. Um, and then I charged in with my core ones with the iron guts. I killed one, um, but was then pretty much pasted and then he threw his battle standard in and they were completely pulverized. Uh, my cauldron was then shot out by his bolt thrower, uh, taking off a bunch of wounds. It did really well that turn. Uh, his dragon dreadlord charged my corsairs and killed eight. Uh, and then the other two were obviously going to run away. I could not pass the battle shock test. And then he won priority on turn four. Finished off my dark riders. Finished off my um, coal one sorceress. Shot out my foot mounted sorceress. Or char I don't know. I don't think he charged her with his um, iron guts. Um, and at that point I conceded the game. I had my Dark Shards left, and that was it. Yeah, all I had left was my Dark Shards. And he had control of all the relics now in the hands of his Iron Guts, his Core Ones, and his Dragon Dreadlord. So I had lost the game. And I don't know how I feel about it. Like, it was 100 wounds, and my army was slightly so optimal. I made some mistakes in my selection. Like, I took my Executioners down to 10. First mistake. They're so powerful that leaving them at anything other than full strength was a mistake. Um, I probably could have got away with taking the Witch Elves out entirely uh, in order to keep the second block of Cold War Knights. I could have easily taken out ten more those ten Witch Elves for five more Cold War Knights and probably done some damage with them. Like, a joint charge between them and the Executioners would have really hurt on the Iron Guts. Or I could have used them in the same way as the Witch Elves without the need for the Death Hag to charge the... Um, Bleak Swords, wipe them out, charge the Master, wipe him out, and then be in a really good menacing position. I could have then taken the Death Hag out on top of that and kept my BSB, which would have maybe come in handy considering how much up in my face he was. So I did make some mistakes in my selection, but that's no major excuse. I think the issue at the end of the day comes down to the fact he had two dragons. It's not the be all and end all as to why I lost the game, but it's a pretty con big contributing factor because. When everything in your collection that he was running that day counts to 85 wounds and 24 of it is, or 28 of it is taken up by two dragons, people now in AOS, and I'm going to try not to rant when I say this, people in AOS are building their armies the wrong way, or in the reverse order. They're buying the big stuff first and not building a solid core, which means that in smaller games, they have an unfair advantage because they've got all the big stuff first. I mean, the guy I was facing, yes, he had bleak swords, yes, he had knights, yes, he had a bolt thrower, he had a nice little mini core, but then he blocked it out with two dragons. In the past, and this is how I would always build my army, you start with the core, 
you get the basic inventory, you get your cavalry, and then you get your heroes and your monsters to round the list off. Uh, you've probably noticed throughout an Elven Adventure, other than the Cauldron, all I've bought is basic units. I've not bought heroes because I don't need them. I don't think they're that... I know they're good, but they're not what I want to do with my army. So I think AOS is encouraging people to build their lists in reverse, and the campaign isn't doing anything to help that. Yes, there's a 50 wound hero cap, hero and monster cap. The problem is that 50 wounds of monsters will kill everything. Generally, 50 wounds of monsters will kill just about anything, and they're really hard to put down unless you've got a lot of shooting. I mean, my army's got a fair bit of shooting, but it was never going to be enough. And I had all the guns that I have in my army facing those two dragons, and I only managed to flink off like two wounds at range, if that. So it is a bit concerning, um, but I think one thing they could do with the campaign is a sort of net ban on flying heroes. Um, limiting them to one, I think, is enough. Like, Archeon was a problem because he's fast, but every other hero I was facing couldn't fly or didn't fly because it was Fate Weaver. Um, I don't mind a couple of monsters. I can deal with a couple of monsters. I mean, I've dealt with Carnosaurs. I've dealt with Demon Princes. I've dealt with Greater Demons. That's not an issue. It's a pro it's tough to do, but it's not a an unbalanced issue. The issue is when those monsters can outrun you and literally strike anywhere on those boards, because we're only playing on a, a 4x4 board. They've basically got entire control of the board because they have a theoretical, I'd say theoretical, um, like 30 inch hit. Of, it's, it's more than 24 because they move more than 12. So they can pretty much hit anywhere on the board on turn two. And that's just really horrible. And when there's two of them, you have no way to deal with it because you have to split your fire or you have to throw into charges you don't want to to keep them contained. It's just not doable. So I think limiting people to one flying monster would be really useful um or maybe splitting so the hero and monster count is divvied up again so you can only have let's say 20 wounds of monsters and then you're allowed 30 wounds of heroes so you can really go in and have a lot of heroes but you don't have a loads and loads and loads of monsters or maybe make it 30 20 just so people can have two and then say one of them can fly so if you want to take a dragon and a hydra you can and then you have 20 wounds freed up for the other heroes you have in your army. I don't really know how they could do it, um, but I feel like in its current state of the campaign, it rewards you for spamming too much. I have no problem with people taking a lot of heroes and monsters. I have a problem with when your army is so heavy on heroes and monsters, particularly flying ones, that you just can't kill them. Plus, it didn't help that he had ogres on top of that. I mean, ogres are basically mini monsters in and of themselves. The Iron Guts unit had 24 wounds packed into it. And it's damaged three. Like, what am I supposed to do? But anyway, I digress. So, campaign update for you. Um, three games, two wins, no relics. Um, because I did win the two games against the Chaos and Lizardman player. I just didn't get any reward for it because of Squeak Tennis. Uh, well, I run it by Age of Sigmar win conditions. I won. So... Yeah, um, mathematically, I'm not quite out, but if we were following like an elimination system, I'd be out of the campaign already. Um, I do think, I think there is still a relic left. It depends. If people didn't find the right relics during the game, then there's a chance there's one or two knocking around. If there's not, then I pretty much will lose every game from here on out. Because those relics are ridiculous, and they make generals basically unstoppable, which is irritating, to say the least. Um, so I'm not quite sure how the next game's going to go. Um, I will let you know in the next episode, of course. Um, but it may get to the point where I'm basically just losing every game horribly. and I don't feel the need to report that to you. So what I might do is if the game is particularly interesting, I'll let you know whether it's win or lose. But if the game's pretty flat and I've got enough modeling stuff, I might just skip over the game or just talk about it in brief. Uh, anyway, so that will bring us to the end of this episode. I do hope you have enjoyed the video. Make sure to leave a like if you did. Leave me the comments down below on the high elf paint scheme that you saw early in the video, on the campaign, some ideas for the army. Anything goes, really, just let me know. Um, if you have missed any last episodes, as I have said before, check the link in the description. You can go and watch where we've been up to up to this point. So, thank you very much for watching the video. I do hope you enjoyed it. My name is Michael for Tactics Imperials. Until the next time, see you all again.
Bye for now.